And so in 2013, I had a <clears throat> hip replacement, and the doctors all knew that I'm prone to asthma attacks. And when we arrived at the hospital, at Harbor Hospital in, in Baltimore, my husband and I kept saying we have to be very careful with mold, dust, we have to be careful with the perfumes that people are wearing, is there any industrial waste being burned here at the hospital, everything has to be sterilized. And so after I came out of the surgery, I had an asthma attack, simply because someone had come in who had been outside in the environment and hadn't sterilized themselves. Uh, needless to say, I survived. But um, each year I'm in the emergency room at least four times a year, particularly when the seasons change. I'm probably about $9,000 in debt with hospital bills from poor air quality. Um, so when I have to leave my home, there are several things that I have to keep in mind. Let me talk first about the equipment I have at home. I have a nebulizer. I take Advir. I take um, Singular to try to keep my lungs open. I have to have my house clean once a week. I can't clean it myself. Uh, I have to wash the ozone layer to make sure they're good days for me to be out. I have to be concerned about industrial waste where I work or near where I work. Um, and so when I leave my home, I also have a peak flow and expander and all those things that asthmatics have. But when I leave my home, I have to take with me a medical kit. And uh, I was going to pull it out and let you see it, but it's too much stuff. So I have, um, of course, my Pro Air, my emergency inhaler. I have to carry with me cotton balls because I get constant nosebleeds. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, leaving work in D.C., I work in D.C., I had to stop at Washington Hospital Center because I couldn't stop a nosebleed. Then I drove 295 coming home. I have to know the hospital routes wherever I go. So I had to stop at Howard County General. Most of the hospitals know me by now. And again, I couldn't stop the nosebleed. It started again. And then when I got to Baltimore, I had to go to Sinai Hospital because I couldn't stop the, ble the bleeding. And at that point, they told me I might need a blood transfusion, but luckily it all worked out. Also, I have to carry Afrin. Afrin's one of the few things that will stop the nosebleeds immediately, or will at least slow it down. And of course, it helps to keep my nostrils and nose system open. I have, I've learned no Vaseline, use saline. Who would have ever known I could have used water back in those days? So I have to always make sure I have saline to keep my nose open. So when I get out of my car, I have to squeeze saline. And when I leave a building and walk back to my car, I have to squeeze saline and blow. Each year, I have to, of course, have to make sure my flu shots are up to date and pneumonia shots. I keep Tylenol in case I get a fever. So sometimes with my aging situation, I don't know if it's a hot flash or a fever, but at any rate, I have to take Tylenol if I feel feverish in order to prevent any type of illness. When I get those really bad nosebleeds, one of the things that will help is if I use Bacotrin, and that is to try to get those spaces in my nose that have been irritated by pollutants to heal. Sometimes they won't heal. Also tissue and cough drops, and I take Zyrtex, and I keep a mask in my uh, purse, and I have to have plenty of fluids like water to keep me hydrated and to keep all those pollutants from interfering with my lungs. So at 60 years old, I have permanent scars that will never go away, um, some of which, of course, I tr strongly believe is a result of, of coal and burning wood and other things that I was exposed to. And of course, since I moved to Maryland, it got worse. And that's when I've been in and out of the hospitals. Prior to moving to Maryland, I did not get hospitalized. I didn't have the emergency room visits. Uh, it's a very scary feeling to rush to the emergency room saying that you can't breathe, I can't breathe. You know, I've had people say to me, but you are breathing. But my air is being compromised. And so, of course, when you feel compromised, you're more frightened, so then you bring in or exhale more air than you need. And so I just want to really advocate for the uh, fact that health care is really a major <clears throat> issue and that um, the time that I spend in hospitals, the money I spend on medical care, I could donate that, that to a charity. I could be more productive in all my volunteer work. Right now my company is being very, very supportive. So when I start to feel sick, they let me telework so I can stay home and stabilize. So at least every other week I'm home stabilizing. Tommy Landers, who's in the uh, audience, we've had several meetings that I've had to reschedule because I'm home stabilizing. So if I begin to feel ill, my uh, course of action is to stay home the next day, use my nebulizer, try to control any pollutants around me, take my medications, and try to get plenty of sleep and rest. 
so that my body can build its immune system to be able to fight off my next day out in the ozone layer or in the poor, poor air situation. So I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but instead what I want you to do is to be educated, to educate others, and to stay aware that every time I take a deep breath, my deep breath is being compromised. And so I ask that we continue to work on issues related to coal and oil and pollutants in our environment that affect us. My happiest scene is to see a windmill. And my second happiest scene is to see a storm because I know a storm is bringing in fresh air. Thank you. Is that it? And you did well, so I want to allow you more time if there's something else that you want to say because oftentimes, again, commute, I don't have as much well, time I, as you I need. do want to talk about, let me talk a little bit more about the health care costs. Okay, talk about the health care costs. And so um, through hospitalization, um, okay, let me look at it, let me, point, let me approach it from this perspective. Most of our hospitals now have pulmonary uh, units. And I used to think that was for old people. And now I'm beginning to realize I'm there with them. And so older people. But it's not just older people or children who are suffering from asthma. It's middle-aged people like myself who didn't live in this area, who moved to this area, and realized that we were suffering from poor air quality. I know that industry is an important thing in terms of jobs, but we need to make sure we have clean power plants and industries that don't affect our long-term ability to survive in this, in this area in this, and in the world in which we live in. So the cost is, as I said, uh, astronomical. I left the, uh, Maryland, I was working for the state of Maryland and went to the federal government mainly to be able to get a higher insurance policy. So when I went to the federal government, I could afford a high option Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so uh, generally because of my history, but also because of my high option Blue Cross Blue Shield, when I arrive at a hospital and they pull me up on the computers, they realize I can pay my bill. And so they're willing to treat me very quickly. I am very concerned about the folks who don't have what I have. And I'm also concerned about what happens the day when they look and realize I owe $8,000 and say, wait a minute, this woman is paying very slowly on these bills. <clears throat> so I just want you to be aware of the fact that um, the amount of money we spend on health care and hospitalization as it relates to illnesses related to poor health, I mean poor air, can be money that can be funneled into other areas. Think about all the other needs in our society that we could spend that money on. And I would gladly prefer to spend my money in other programs for children. And I'm very big on reentry as it relates to ex-offenders. And so some of the other causes that I would like to be able to spend my money on. But instead, I pay um, $190 a week in insurance out of my paycheck. And that's to get a week, not, not bi-weekly, a week to make sure that when I arrive at a hospital or a health care center, I won't be turned away. Last time I went to the emergency room, I was told I had to pay a $250 copay, and that was the first time I'd ever heard that. So if you're laying there and you cannot breathe, you do not want to hear, you've got to write me a check for $250. And so my husband goes with me now so he can advocate with me when he can. You know, if I'm in the car by myself, then I usually write a note and say, uh, I do not have the $250 on me, or I'll write you a check. Because if I'm, if, if I'm struggling for air, I don't have time to argue with you over $250. And so my husband in Baltimore always goes with me and fight that battle. So again, um, I'd like to be able to spend my money on some things that are much more meaningful to me, but I need to live. So I have to breathe in order to live. Okay. I think it's always important that communities have enough time to speak. Um, so thank you for allowing me to do that. Mike, do you want to stay up there or come up here? Okay, Mr. Mike Tidwell. Start my timer. Sorry. I'll be the gong. All right. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, Chris, it's always uh, amazing to hear your story. Uh, which I've heard a number of times and uh, if I ever have a second where I wonder if I'm doing the right thing with my life to promote clean energy I just remember you and all the people you represent and it's um, 
uh, it's a great uh, human rights issue um, and a civil rights issue and an everybody rights issue. Um, and uh, I wanted to widen the lens a little bit. My name is Mike Tidwell, director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. And you know, just as we have these these microcosms of, of people suffering suffering from poor health due to our energy choices, of course we have this larger issue of the entire planet suffering because of our energy choices. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the recent news that the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, about as far away from College Park in Baltimore as we could possibly imagine, but having huge impact on our state of Maryland. The West Antarctic ice sheet is melting uh, parts of it irreversibly. Um, just this last week, uh, there was news that um, the oceans are warming so fast that now the water from below is melting the ice that's connected to the landmass that once gone, it will just grease the rail for massive glaciers uh, to pour in to our world's oceans from Antarctica. That alone could lead to 11 feet, 11 feet of sea level rise for the state of Maryland, which has 3,000 miles of tidal shorelines. Um, so this is a huge, huge issue. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists did an amazing uh, study report a couple of months ago where they tried to quantify and say, well, what will it look like for Annapolis? What will it look like for Baltimore if we get three, four, five feet of sea level rise? And, and you could go on their site, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, just Google their recent sea level rise. Um, study and you can click on for example Baltimore and Baltimore County and three to four feet of sea level rise well what would that mean um, and they quantified things like uh, 57 miles of roads gone uh, two schools gone uh, three churches gone three medical facilities gone thousands of acres of land two waste superfund sites uh, inundated um, this is the, this is the reality this is what sea level rise based on our use of oil coal and natural gas will do to our planet and to our, our state now, there are a number of things that motivate me to be a full-time climate activist and to push for the windmills that you can look at and be inspired by. Um, but one of the biggest issues is that in the 1980s, between 1984 and 1987, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was called Zaire at the time. I lived among village folks in small villages, uh, grass thatch roofs, mud-walled huts, and for these people that I live with in the middle of uh, uh, the Congo, it wasn't a question of clean wind-powered electricity versus dirty coal-fired electricity. They didn't have electricity. It wasn't a question of clean hybrid Prius car versus gas-guzzling SUV. They didn't have cars. There weren't even roads there. You're talking about people who contribute almost nothing to climate change in terms of fossil fuels, but who are right now being walloped by unrecognizable weather. Incredible droughts punctuated by unbelievable, unspeakable flooding right now. Climate change right now among these innocent people in Africa means food off the table right now for their kids. Um, a continent of about a billion people who generate maybe two to three percent of all the world's greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, the United States, less than five percent of the world's population, we generate 25 percent of all the world's greenhouse gases. And you know, I often say in a perfect world, in a just world, a country like ours that generates 25 percent of all the world's greenhouse gases, we would get 25 percent of all the world's warming right on top of our nation, just telescoped down on top of us. And if that were the case, if we got our fair share of the warming, our economy would already be destroyed. Florida would already be a series of islands. Kansas would be a scrub desert. But since we can share the warming with Africa and share it with Bangladesh and share the warming with South Pacific Island nations that are going to completely disappear due to climate change, we as a nation in the United States tend not to get too worked up about this climate change thing. And I submit to you that this is utterly and totally morally unacceptable what we are knowingly doing to the planet through our use of fossil fuels. And that's what motivates me. That's the larger frame, I think, of environmental justice, not just what it's ha doing uh, locally in terms of health and sea level rise here in Maryland, but what it's doing to all these innocent people and nations all over the world who are vulnerable and are not contributing to climate change. So that's one of the really big things that motivates me. So what can we do in Maryland? The federal carbon rule is good, but it's not going to save us. 
is not nearly strong enough. The fiddle carbon rule is really for the laggard states that are really far behind that aren't doing much. The fiddle carbon rule is going to push them to do more. But what could a state like Maryland that's already been active in promoting clean energy do? And the reality is um, in 2013, Governor Martin O'Malley came out with a greenhouse gas plan, uh, a, a blueprint to guide all of us for the next 10 years or so. And in that plan, after careful study from the Maryland Department of the Environment and others, uh, there are all these different policy tools for how we can decarbonize our economy. And the top most powerful tool delineated by the governor's greenhouse gas plan, his blueprint, the most powerful tool was something called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Sounds very wonky, but basically it's a clean electricity standard, a mandatory clean electricity standard. <clears throat> and what we need to do because uh, electricity, dirty electricity, contributes about 40% to all the greenhouse gases in our state. If we want to get serious about decarbonizing our, our economy, we have to get off of coal-fired and gas-fired electricity as fast as we can. And the good news is we can do it. We can do it quickly. So the really big bill in Annapolis, the number one energy bill, you know, when we're talking about climate justice and environmental justice and energy justice in our state of Maryland, the number one bill in 2015 in Annapolis that lawmakers are going to be looking at is a bill that would double the mandatory standard for clean wind and solar power. It's called a 40% renewable portfolio standard. Right now, we have a goal to get 20% of our electricity from clean sources by the year 2020. The bill that's going to be introduced would turn that to 40% and get there by the year 2025. You're basically talking about a big ramp up, a real increase in clean renewable energy. There's enough of it out there. We've already done the research regionally. There's plenty of clean energy that we can tap. It's affordable. It probably costs well below $2 per household. There's gonna be a feature in this bill that will actually um, uh, remove low-income ratepayers from being uh, responsible under the bill. They will actually be compensated fully and held harmless because we feel that that's the uh, environmental just thing to do. So this is a great bill and it can be done. Minnesota passed a 40% clean electricity standard in uh, 2013, their House of Delegates. Their Senate didn't pass it yet, but they expect that bill to pass in 2015. There are other states looking to ramp up their clean electricity standards. New York, Massachusetts. The reality is Congress is stuck in gridlock. We know that. Half the people in Congress think global warming is a hoax. We know that. So let's go around Congress. If enough progressive states, 10, 11, 12 states, pass dramatic RPS standards like Minnesota, Maryland, New York, et cetera, and we get up to 30, 40, 50% clean energy, that's gonna promote so much wind and solar that it's gonna drop so much in price because of economies of scale. And coal and gas, yes, even gas, are done. We're done with fracking. We're done with tar sands. So the point I wanna make is we're a small state and, you know, I, I, some of our friends, uh, more conservative friends in our state, uh, even one who was recently elected governor, um, say, There's, if Maryland unplugged everything, if we didn't emit one more pound of CO2, we would not stop one centimeter of sea level rise in the world because it's a global problem. Well, literally, that's true. But if you follow that that thinking, you would never uh, change a light bulb in your house. You would never open a door for another person. You would never do anything kind or generous on a personal level that was right because that's not gonna change the whole world. Of course we do the right thing. We do all we can. But on this issue, by passing a 40% clean electricity standard in Maryland, we have a chance of changing our whole nation, inspiring other states to follow in our in our path and literally decarbonizing the national economy because we're going to promote so much wind and solar and inspire other states that even without Congress we're going to change markets. So that's the exciting news and I want to make sure that you guys take action on this today. Um, we have petitions at our table, we have fact sheets right here. Um, don't leave today. Do we have a, a, the petition uh, clipboard here to pass no, around? Not here, but we will at lunch and then later. Okay. So I want to make sure you, you get signed up so we can inform you about this bill as it makes its way through Annapolis um, and that you get a chance to take action. Uh, one thing I will say that there are some folks who are concerned that this uh, uh, clean energy incentive would, might incentivize things other than wind and solar. It's a reality that unfortunately our General Assembly did qualify trash incineration as a 
clean, uh, quote unquote, clean energy a few years ago. It was wrong. We fought it. We tried to get the governor to veto this bill um, of adding trash incineration to tier one of the clean electricity standard. We lost. It became part of the law. The good news, though, is that there has not been a new trash incinerator built in this country since 1995. The economics, thankfully for us, the economics of burning garbage to create electricity just don't work, and they're not anywhere near being able to work. We've crunched all the numbers, and it is absolutely the case that even if you double the standard for clean energy, um, you're not going to incentivize any new trash incineration. I would never support a bill that I thought would incentivize trash incineration. So I just want to emphasize that that is the case. You're, what you are going to see is a dramatic increase in wind and solar. Now, one last question. Uh, everyone's thinking, well, we got a new governor. How are you going to pass a bill like that? A dramatic expansion in clean energy to fight this thing called global warming that maybe our governor doesn't even believe is happening. Uh, Kathy mentioned a dramatic bill that's cleaned up all our coal-fired power plants in this state, the Healthy Air Act, the, the biggest coal-fired power plant cleanup bill in the history of the world. There has never been a bill stronger than that one passed in 2006 to clean up dirty power plants, and it was passed under a Republican governor. The, the Democratic General Assembly passed the bill. The Republican governor, he didn't veto it. He didn't let it become law without his signature. He had a ceremony to sign it into law. Divided government can still do the right thing. The original clean electricity standard that we're now expanding to 40% was passed in 2004 under the same Republican governor, Bob Early. We can do this. This, what we want to do is right, it is economically just, it is environmentally fair, it is a human rights issue. So I invite you, take action, get involved in this, and we can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you all feel riled up. Yeah. Okay. So we have heard from Kathy, the state of the air in Maryland, and what they have done to reduce some of the critical pollutants that are coming out of our coal-fired power plants. We've heard from Christine the personal perspective and why all this mess matters. And we've heard from Mike some tangible ways that, that folks in this room and beyond can get engaged. So at this point, let's spend the rest of the time talking. So uh, if folks have questions, uh, clarification questions, uh, please come up to the mic in the middle so we can hear you. Uh, and, and if I don't get any willing volunteers, I have plenty of them. But yes, sir, go for it. I'm uh, Andy Fellows. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> I'm Andy Fellows. I'm uh, I, and I'm also the mayor of College Park. So welcome to College Park. Uh, but I also I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Keeler, uh, the the Baltimore City sort of piece of this. Has your city council and the mayor um, done much to sort of support uh, both climate change, sort of address the issues you've been talking about? And, yeah, I guess I, I really w appreciate your remarks because it really brought it, I think, home to all of us about the health care impacts of the way that we've been doing things. Thanks. Our local uh, power, which is BG&E, has talked a lot about improving the use of our grids, our electrical grids, by using air from the ocean. Uh, but in terms of specific action, I'm not aware of any. Hi, uh, I'm Richard Reese. Um, I, um, one of the things I do is I'm um, the energy chair for the Maryland Sierra Club. Um, a couple of things that uh, I noted, uh, well, they were, uh, certainly Kathy mentioned this, uh, but um, I'd like to uh, emphasize this and um, I'll give you an opportunity to comment on it. And that is uh, that uh, there's a lot of uh, industries and uh, um, it, uh, in service industries that uh, stand to benefit uh, from uh, aggressive uh, demand reduction. Uh, I know that you mentioned that as one of the uh, key parts, one of the four points uh, for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, uh, I guess uh, the other thing that I'm, we're concerned about, a lot of people within the club are concerned about, is uh, the uh, potential uh, to incentivize uh, dirty uh, things uh, by increasing the RPS. I mean, we're supportive of increasing the RPS, but at the same time, we believe that it's a good idea to cap the bad stuff, to prevent it from being increased uh, 
prevent the incentives from going forward uh, for increasing it. That's really <coughs> mostly directed toward Mike. Um, and, uh, but I'd love to see uh, other people comment on that as well. Uh, uh, in other words, conservation and uh, uh, efficiency and also making sure the uh, increase in the RPS doesn't uh, cause us to actually burn bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I think that's kind of yeah. a tech. So Kathy, Mike, you yeah. want to address okay. that? So, uh, this on. Okay, so on your first question, I assume you're talking about distributed generation. Is that what you're referring to? No, I'm actually referring to uh, reductions in electric demand. Uh, in other words, using less electricity, thus burning less coal, burning less natural gas, eventually phasing out fossil fuels. Right. Um, through uh, demand reduction. And, and, I'm just not sure what your question is. I mean, that's a good I mean, thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right? Totally is, but I, I, I guess I, maybe I want you to reemphasize it, and I'm interested in hearing about that also from Mike, because you oh. mentioned renewable energy, but uh, didn't mention that part. Okay, so you're wanting to know what are we doing in the state of Maryland to uh, 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 facilitate expansion of energy efficiency? Well, I guess uh, the question more is, uh, what kind of uh, advocacy can we do for that? I know that we have in Power Maryland mm -hmm. and uh, there are other programs for doing that, but um, it, it's a really key part of uh, our push for clean energy. Right. So the Maryland Energy Administration in Maryland is the key agency that funds energy efficiency uh, measures. Um, they get um, uh, uh, some of their funding for energy efficiency from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, and so uh, it, uh, one important thing to do is to ensure that those revenues uh, continue to be directed toward energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Uh, and I would say, you know, that, um, and I'm just speaking for myself, not for, um, not for the, the, this administration or the next administration, but I, I think, you know, um, perhaps increasing the flow of funds um, to, those, to, that, uh, to those programs uh, would be very helpful, um, you know, to increase the amount, the, the, the number of energy efficiency projects and the uh, amount of reduction that way that we're getting. I mean, these are, it's important. Um, the, the power plants um, have these Empower programs under Empower. They develop their energy efficiency uh, programs. There is a process in place for the public to comment on those programs. And I think it's really, it would be really important for folks who are interested in, in engaging on these issues to, uh, to look at these plans that they have, because oftentimes there, are, there is a lot of room for improvement um, and enhancements. And, and the Public Service Commission needs to hear from people. Um, we comment on them. You know, we at the Department of Environment file formal comments on these plans. Um, and, I'm sh and, I, and I'm not sure, you know, just how engaged the community is on, you know, reviewing these plans and, and recommending changes and enhancements to these plans. Um, because actually the, the, the funding that the utilities are, are you know, putting into, um, are, are putting into their energy efficiency programs is significant, but it probably can be enhanced and improved. Okay. We've got to do more. No and Mike, did you about. have a quick response? Yeah, and just in terms of uh, uh, incineration, um, uh, first of all, there, there's no way this bill's gonna, as written, is gonna incentivize incineration. Um, to uh, take uh, trash incineration out of Tier One uh, would be would be a multi-year major legislative battle. It would be a multi-year, we'd have to make that the priority for the next three or four years and get all the state's environmental groups working on it because you'd be taking on the unions, you'd be taking on uh, the, the, the next governor. Uh, it, you would just have to make that alone your priority for three or four years um, it, it, for something that we don't even need because it's not gonna incinerate, uh, uh, it's not gonna incentivize incineration. So that would just be the argument that I would make. If you wanna cap it or remove it, it's still gonna be a multi-year major battle. 
So it's a question of what do you want to spend your time on for what results? So I'm happy to talk to you more about it and talk about the strategy. Okay, thank you. And what I'm going to ask is that uh, keep your question to one breath. <laughs> so we can get through, if you can, just one question, then our speakers will be available after because there's a short break. So thank you. All right. Um, um, James August. Um, I've spent uh, my adult life in the labor movement in working in for occupational, to remove occupation, uh, toxins from the workplace and in the environment. And I just want to say one thing in response to your uh, story is that um, what this is about, when you talked about you know, losing weight, getting in better health, all these things, these personal lifestyle choices, which are all important, of course, but uh, it really comes down to a matter of involuntary versus voluntary exposures. And that's really the crux of public health and what all of this is about, is all of us are, are potentially victims because we don't choose to be exposed to this stuff. And that needs to be our message when we're trying to organize around this stuff, that um, we talk about scarring in lungs. I dealt with people with asbestos, silicosis. These are, nobody chose to breathe these things in, but they suffer for a lifetime as a result of it. Now to my, uh, the question I wanted to raise was, um, I just want to voice a note of caution, Mike. I've, I've met with Tommy and, and stuff around the RPS. Obviously, we want to get to 40%. Um, uh, I'm now working with a group. Uh, I'm, I'm a consultant now, uh, but I'm working with a group of uh, folks that are concerned about uh, sustainable businesses. And people have come to me, I, I'm not versed on the issue at all, so I don't, I'm just a conduit here. But people have come to me and have expressed a great deal of concerns about the incineration and other issues in Tier 1. And I'm just, um, I think I'm just asking that we, we figure out, uh, we, need to, we need to have a sit down with the groups that are voicing these concerns. If you say nothing's going to be incentivized, I can't, you know, but that conversation needs to take place before the session opens so we get everybody on board with a position they can support and if amendments are necessary, you know, find out which ones are feasible without setting back the whole thing. But I think, I think we need to step back and make sure we get as many players on the, on the same page as possible going into the session. Yeah, and those conversations have been going on for months and we have all kinds of data on our website. You can go to chesapeakeclimate.org. We take this issue on head on. We lay out all the reasons, the arguments. So extended conversations with lots and lots and lots of groups. We met with the mayor of College Park, for example, and other people concerned. So that, that's ongoing for sure. And I would never support a bill that would lead to combustion of anything. Period. Yeah. I've spent 12 years of my life pushing for clean energy. Right. I would never support a bill that would lead to combustion. I, I'm not pointing. I'm, I'm just being a conduit of people who have sure. expressed concerns to me that I don't fully understand, but I want to make sure that there's a forum where sure. everybody is fully informed about what the various issues are so that we can not feel any reservations about supporting the RPS. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Allen. I'm the Director of Eco Opportunity at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, wanted to ask uh, Ms. Keels, as a person who's been directly impacted by these carcinogens and your health matters and so forth, uh, what's your perspective on how the Affordable Care Act of 2010 is actually working? And I'm not going to call it the uh, Obamacare Act, but the uh, Affordable Care Act, what it is, of, of, of 2010. How, how is that working from your perspective, or, or not working? Okay. I think that it's a growing effort. It's still in transition. But I think that what it has done is provided more opportunities for people to acquire health care, and particularly education around some of the issues. The clientele that I work with in the inner city in Washington, D.C., are not really informed about climate issues. So it gives them an opportunity for greater education, greater awareness. So I think, and, and this is what we're going to talk about tomorrow, is that the faith-based community needs to get more involved in educating the communities. And uh, so that's one of the areas I'd like to work in. But I think that the health, the new health.